take a break from our studies on the book of Romans this morning and address a subject I have never addressed to this congregation. And that is the subject of ministerial training or the training of men for the work of the ministry. And this subject is highly re relevant for the entire church because the church as described in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 is the pillar and foundation of the truth. The church is the divinely created and appointed agency to support the truth and to hold it up high. It is therefore the church's duty to preserve, to protect, and to propagate the truth. And included in this duty is to train men for the work of the ministry or ministerial training. Now one portion of scriptures that bristles with instruction about ministerial training is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. So I want you to please turn your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's begin our reading from verse 1. Paul writing to Timothy under the infallible guidance of the Spirit. We read in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So let's join our hearts and pray for the Lord's blessing as we consider this portion of his word. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you that everything we need for life and salvation, and even as a church under the headship of the Lord Jesus, that we have them all that we need, how we are to live, what we are to do, in the words of scriptures. And as we now look particularly at this portion of your word, we pray for illumination from the Holy Spirit. Help us as a church to regard all that Christ has commissioned the church to do seriously and give us wisdom to an insight into your word that we may live in the light of the will of Christ in the church. Hear us, we pray, for these things we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. Now from this portion of scripture read in your hearing, what is the essence of ministerial training? Well, the key is found in the verb in trust. That is an imperative or is middle second person singular. That is, the verb is in the middle voice. In the middle voice is a technical term for giving something to someone in trust for safekeeping, to commit, to deposit, to entrust. The idea is that something highly valuable is deposited and entrusted to someone else. Now as we open up the passage then, our exposition revolves then around that key word, in trust. And first, I want us to consider what are the things to be entrusted. What are the things to be entrusted? Look at verse 2. The things which you, Timothy, have heard from me, 
from the Apostle Paul in the presence of many witnesses entrust this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The things Timothy has heard from Paul in the presence of many witnesses, these are the things that Timothy is to entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And what are the things that Timothy has heard from Paul in the presence of many witnesses which he is to entrust to faithful men? Well, note what Paul said earlier in chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. As he addresses Timothy, he says in verse 13 of chapter 1, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. What Timothy heard from Paul is here described as the standard of sound words. And this refers to the apostolic teachings. Paul is a source of sound words because he is an apostle of Jesus Christ an appointed infallible communicator of God's message his teachings are not just his words but they are the words of God himself this is clear from other portions of scriptures. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. Oh, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica about how they have received the ministry of the apostle Paul together with his companions. Verse 13, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, from the apostles, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God which also performs its work in you. Who believe. Note that the words heard by the Thessalonians from the Apostle Paul and his companions are identified as the very words of the living God. They were not just the words of men, but the very words of God, which is active, living, and powerful. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Again, just to buttress the same point. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1, Paul says, When I came to you, that is to this, this Corinthians, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you what? The testimony of God. The revelation of the mind and the will of God. And then in verse 7, as Paul develops this thought, verse 7, but, when, but we, that is the apostles, speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they have understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of men, all that God has prepared for those who love him. And then in verse 10, for to us, that is the apostles, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we, that is the apostles, 
have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. How did the apostles of Jesus come to know the thoughts of God? How did they know the plans of God? God revealed these thoughts to them through the Spirit. The Spirit who knows even the depths of God. Just as only the Spirit of a man knows the thoughts of a man, so also the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. And God revealed his thoughts to the apostles of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And this revelation done by the Holy Spirit to them did not just include the thoughts, but even the words used to express those thoughts were given by the Spirit. Plenary or verbal inspiration. Thus, the words of the apostles are the very words of God. And in Ephesians chapter 3, again the same thought. Ephesians 3 verse 1 to 5, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. The mystery of Christ that was not made known to the sons of man in generations past has now been more clearly revealed by God to his holy apostles and prophets in the Holy Spirit. The apostles and the New Testament prophets were the conduits of God's final and ultimate revelation to men. Now this standard of sound words that Timothy heard from Paul are the very words of God. And he heard it in the presence of many witnesses, as we are told in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. The things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. This indicates that the apostolic teachings that Paul, that Timothy heard from Paul were not secret teachings handed privately by Paul to Timothy. They were teachings that Paul publicly proclaimed and many have heard of them. And these teachings are now preserved, summarized, comprehended, and universally published for us in the completed scriptures. And that is what is to be entrusted. So that is what is to be entrusted. Now that leads us to our second point. What does it mean to entrust these things to faithful men? What does it mean to entrust these things? Again, notice in verse 2 of 2 Timothy 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, this is crucial to our understanding of ministerial training. 
As mentioned earlier, the word in trust in a middle voice is a technical term for something given to someone in trust for safekeeping. It means to commit, to deposit, to entrust. It assumes knowledge of the word of God on the part of the one entrusting. The standard of sound words and what the teacher knows he is to entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now that is vital. The biblical concept of ministerial training, you see, is no longer the present day concept of ministerial training. Training. The practice so common today, even among evangelical churches, is just to give men skills in running a church or running a ministry. And just to acquaint the men of the different theological positions various men have upheld through the centuries. There is no effort to examine and critique those various theological positions by a careful exegesis of the Bible. And the biblical teachings are not presented and demonstrated with a careful, painstaking exegesis of the Bible. So men are just given a wide range of differing views and they are left to choose for themselves what theological position they are most inclined to take. Men are just given a smorgasbord of different theological beliefs and positions, and they are left to choose for themselves whatever they feel most inclined to Embrace the idea of entrusting the teachings of the Word of God is entirely missing. Now, that's not true of all, but in the large evangelical seminaries that train men, this is the approach. No doubt this idea of a ministerial training is the result of philosophical truths and convictions that have greatly influenced the world for more than a century. But this has crept into the church. Philosophical trends that try to undermine the authority of the Bible, the sufficiency of the Bible, and the clarity of the teachings of the Bible. And these philosophical ideas have dictated even how ministerial training is to be done by the church. But that is not the biblical concept of ministerial training. Ministerial training involves entrusting the apostolic teachings preserved to us now in scriptures to faithful men who will also be able to teach others as well. This assumes knowledge of the teacher of, of the teachings of God's word in the one entrusting. And this knowledge is to be deposited or entrusted to faithful men who will also be able to teach others. So those who receive the deposit know what the deposit is. They do not come out tra of training wondering what the apostolic and biblical teachings really are. They come out knowing and having the deposit with them through a careful, diligent, painstaking study of all of the word of God. And what should this deposit consist? 
the deposit should consist of sound biblical principles of handling accurately the scriptures. Note what Paul says to Timothy later in 2 Timothy 2 verse 14. He says, Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. Timothy is to present himself approved not just to men but to God. The author of scripture as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. And that is in contrast to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. Referring to the letters of the Apostle Paul, verse 16. As also in all his letters, which are part of New Testament scripture. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Not most, but some. Not impossible, but hard. In which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort or twist as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own understanding. So the deposit should include principles of accurately handling the word of God. They must be taught how to handle the scriptures properly. That they will not misrepresent the word of God. That they interpret Old Testament prophecies according to how the apostles interpreted those Old Testament prophecies. Moreover, this deposit should consist of a comprehensive, not exhaustive, but comprehensive knowledge of all the major themes and topics of the Bible. Biblical and systematic theology. Furthermore, this deposit should consist of knowledge and wisdom in using and applying scriptures for the preservation and maturation of Christians individually and churches Corporately. Note what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This phrase... Man of God may be adequate. Man of God is a technical term for a minister of the word of God. And, this, and in scripture, a minister of God's word has everything he needs to do his work. In the training of men or God's people in righteousness, teaching, reproof, Correction, training in righteousness. And that includes individual Christians and churches corporately. Ministerial training, therefore, should consist of entrusting men with the knowledge and wisdom in using and applying scriptures in doing the work of ministry. Teaching. Reproving, correcting, training in righteousness. 
That's the deposit. But then that leads us to our third point. Having considered what are the things to be entrusted, what does it mean to entrust these things? That leads us to our third point. Who are to be entrusted with these things? Who are to be trained? Look at the language. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now there are two descriptions which are qualifications for ministerial training. The first First, there is an essential character trait. Faithful men. Faithful men. The meaning is quite plain and simple. It means to be reliable, dependable, loyal, trustworthy. It is the opposite of being unreliable, undependable, lack of loyalty, and untrustworthiness. They are to be faithful men. And this faithfulness includes several specifics. If we look at scriptures, what this faithfulness involves. Faithfulness includes commitment to God and to the word of God. They must be men committed to the truths of the Bible. Those who are to be trained for the ministry should be men who have proven themselves to be faithful to God and to the word of God. They should be men who buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, 23. They will not surrender the truth for whatever the price even if the price means no race in one's employment, being dismissed from work, being opposed and persecuted, and even put to death. They are men who buy the truth and sell it not. For whatever price. Faithful men. You cannot let them sell the truth. I'll give you this. I'll offer you. Whatever the word of God says. That's what the word of God says. They must be faithful men. Moreover, faithfulness includes that you can count on a person's silence. Proverbs 11.13 He who goes about as a tale-bearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy or faithful conceals a matter. He's a man who you can trust that he will not divulge unnecessarily and gossip about things which others have no business knowing. Dili tabian. You tell him something, the next day everybody knows about it. You cannot trust him. With secrets. In addition, faithfulness includes that you can count on a person's promises and performance. If they make a promise, they will do their best to fulfill it unless God providentially hinders them. And if they are tasked to do something, they will do their best to fulfill it unless God providentially hinders. They're the kind of person who says, I'll be there. You know he will be there. 
unless he broke a bone or is laid on the bed and cannot stand up and go. You know you can rely on him. He will be here. He will be here. In addition, faithfulness includes that you can count on a person's testimony. Proverbs 14.5 A trustworthy witness will not lie. Or a faithful witness will not lie. But a false witness utters lies. A faithful witness will tell the truth. He is not going to tell a lie for the sake of someone or for the sake of others. And faithfulness, finally, includes you can count on the person's faithful dealings with your soul. Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Notice the perfect contrast. Faithful, deceitful. Wound, Kisses, friend, enemy. A true and faithful friend will tell you what you really need to hear. Even if you don't like to hear it. Because that is what you really need to hear. He wants to help you. But a person who will do, who will not do that. But will only say things that you want to hear is not really your friend, but your enemy. He just wants to make you feel good so that he will be nice to you. And he doesn't really have in mind your best interests. You can rely on a faithful friend. You can rely that your true friend will tell you the truth about yourself. Even if you feel bad about it. Because he is faithful. So that's the qualification. Faithful men. Not just anybody ought to be trained. And isn't it sad that in many seminaries, even evangelical seminaries, it is used as a rehabilitation for men. Hmm? No. Who are to be trained? The cream of the crop. The faithful men. Those who have proven themselves not perfect, but faithful men. And then there is a second qualification. There is not only a character qualification, an essential character trait, but there is also potential giftedness. Potential Giftedness. Look at verse 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now I call this qualification as potential giftedness to teach because the end in view of entrusting the apostolic teaching is that those to whom it is entrusted will be able to teach others also. In other words, the ability to teach is not yet a quality that is already possessed, but is the end in view of the training. It should, however, be clearly, already clear that even prior to the entrusting, the person already manifests some ability to teach. A potential. A potential giftedness to teach. 
And what would that involve? Potential giftedness. Some mental and verbal ability to communicate words clearly. To enunciate words clearly. Some people may have a lot of knowledge, but they do not have the mental ability to communicate those thoughts clearly and convincingly. You hear him preach or talk to you for an hour and you say, Man, what's your point? I don't see your point at all. You keep going around in circles. What's your point? And my point is, and then after that you say, I still don't see your point. Others who may have the mental ability to communicate words and thoughts clearly might have some verbal inability. They can't pronounce their words clearly. Oh, Baba. Anna. What? What did you say? Not that good? You see, have you heard people like that? I have, I heard a pastor really talking like that. I had no idea what he was saying. You have to strain your ears to understand the words that flows out of his mouth. Now those, those who are to be trained for the ministry, should already show that they have some mental ability to communicate their words clearly and verbal ability to communicate God's word clearly, convincingly. Furthermore, this potential giftedness also includes some ability to apply wisely God's word to people in concrete situations. In Colossians 1 and verse 28. Colossians 1 and verse 28. Notice what Paul says here. Verse 28, we, that is the apostles, proclaim him, we proclaim Christ admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ for this purpose also I labor striving according to his power which mightily works within me. you see there is a difference between mere knowledge of the word of God and wisdom in applying that word to concrete situation. I know of a person who can locate and even quote from memory so many passages of scripture. But that person has very little wisdom in seeing the proper applications and relevance of those texts. He or she has memorized. A person to be trained for the ministry should already show some degree of ability, wisdom, to apply God's word wisely in concrete situations. And then, this potential giftedness also includes some ability to communicate God's word in a gracious manner. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach patient when wrong, with meekness, gentleness, or better, meekness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses. Must not be quarrelsome, the Lord's bond servant. Be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with meekness, correcting 
Note that the ability to teach is intimately connected with a gracious manner in doing. There is correcting, but it is done in patience, in meekness. In other words, he must be a person who does not explode when you are discussing biblical doctrines, he become very abusive in his speech, hot-headed. Uh -uh. That's potentially dangerous. The man must learn to be one, to discuss matters in a gracious manner. To teach others. Particularly in private situations where you have a monologue type of teaching that one does not easily get offended and explodes or angry or impatient. Tabugo niyo? Klaro ana? Mm-mm. There must be some degree of ability to communicate God's word in a gracious manner. Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now there should, you cannot, this is potential giftedness. Okay? It's still something you trained a man for, but you see the potentials of a man. Giftedness, but faithful men, that's not potential, that's actual. Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So those are those who will be entrusted. But that leads us to our fourth point. Who is to entrust these things? Who is to entrust these things? Look at verse 2 again of 2 Timothy 2. The things which you, and who's the you? Timothy, have heard from me, the Apostle Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In our passage, Paul is referring to Timothy. This is a work that Timothy was exhorted to do. And what do we know about Timothy from scriptures? Here I will be try I will try to be very quick. First, Timothy was one who had been entrusted with the apostolic teachings. This is the theme Paul had already mentioned in his first letter in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20. Paul says, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. The word. The apostolic teaching. Guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge which some have professed and has gone astray from the faith. So Timothy was one who was entrusted with the apostolic teaching and this becomes a dominant emphasis in Paul's second letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1, we have already read this earlier. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard! Through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which had been entrusted to you. You see, you don't only need brain. You need the Spirit to be faithful to the things entrusted. Chapter 2, verse 2. Entrust to faithful men. Chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. You, however, continue in the things you have learned. And become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them. 
and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired. So Timothy was one who has been entrusted with apostolic teachings. Furthermore, in scripture, Timothy is an evangelist or an apostolic delegate. The term evangelist is only used three times in the New Testament. It is used in Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. It is also used to refer to Philip the evangelist, one of the seven. Acts 21 verse 8. Moreover, Paul exhorts Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 5 to do the work of an evangelist to fulfill his ministry. And it is clear from Acts that Philip had closed ties with the apostles who were in Jerusalem. And in the case of Timothy, it is clear that he was an intimate associate with the apostle Paul and acted as Paul's delegate. He would send them to churches to remind them of the apostolic teachings prior to the completions completion of the New Testament scriptures. Other men also acted in that same capacity like Titus. Since the apostles had the care of all the churches of Christ, 2 Timothy or 2 Corinthians 11 verse 8, and since they could not visit all the churches at once, they needed certain men who could help them and act as their representative to remind the churches of the apostolic teachings since the New Testament at that time was still not yet complete. In fact, these evangelists are sometimes even cited as co-authors of apostolic letters to churches. Paul and Timothy to the church of God. That's how some of the apostolic letters are worded. Paul and Timothy to the churches of Corinth. So in a sense, evangelists were more of helpers and extensions of the apostles. In the words of James Bannerman, they, the evangelists, using the word strictly in a biblical sense, are exhibited to us in the scripture narrative as the attendance, attendance to the apostles in their journeys. Their assistance in planting and establishing the churches, acting under them as their delegates and carrying out their instruction. So there are now no more evangelists in the strict biblical use of the word because we have now the apostolic instructions preserved to us in our completed new Testament. But the thing I want you to note is that Timothy was a minister of the word of God. Furthermore, Timothy was a man of proven worth and respectability in Acts 16. In Acts 16 and verse 1, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And the disciple and a disciple was there named Timothy. Here's Timothy. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him. Okay? He was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra. And like, he had a good reputation among the churches. That's Timothy. So what does this teach us about the men who should be involved in the training of men? Like Timothy, they should be men who are involved in the work of the ministry. Not ivory tower theologians who do nothing but theorize. They should be men involved in the work of the ministry. They should be men 
who labor in the field. Moreover, they should be faithful men who have been entrusted with the apostolic teaching. They should be men who have proven their worth as faithful ministers of the word of God. And then finally, one more point. What context are these things to be entrusted? The context. The answer to that is the church. That is what is assumed in the passage. For in what context that does Paul assumes this instruction, this training, this entrusting to faithful men so that they will also be able to teach others. If you look at 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14. I am writing these things to you, Timothy, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And then notice how the church is described, the pillar and support or foundation of the truth. The church is described as the pillar and foundation of the truth. It serves to support the truth. It serves to lift it up high. It is the church's responsibility to advocate the truth, to propagate the truth, to defend the truth, to preserve the truth, to train men to be preachers of the truth. When Paul wrote his first and second letters to Timothy, Timothy was assigned by Paul as an apostolic delegate in the church in Ephesus. That's clear. If you read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And note the exhortation of Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. See, although... Timothy was already a minister. That doesn't mean to say that his growth as a minister has ended. No. He still continues to grow. Verse 22. Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the name of the Lord, on the Lord from a pure heart. Paul always assumes that the Christian life is lived in the community of God's true people. The church. The church. Moreover, it is only right for us to assume that these faithful men who were to be entrusted with apostolic and biblical teaching were part of that community of God's true people in Ephesus, the church. And this is vital in carrying out the mandate of ministerial training. Ministerial training should be the ministry of the church. It is the responsibility of the church. It is to be done in the context of the church. Those who train men in the ministry should be part of the church. And by church I mean not some invisible church, but a local, visible church. And those who are being trained should be members. Of a church. And this training should be done in the context of a church that is well ordered and biblically functional. And why is the church the proper context of ministerial? It is the context of the church that men being trained are provided pastoral nurture. Obey your leaders, submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Hebrews 13, 7. And it is in the context of the church that men are provided not just pastoral nurture, but congregational 
nurture. Pastoral nurture is never enough. There is a need also of congregational nurture where members seek to help one another and in love minister wisely and graciously the word of God one to another, helping one another and praying for one another. It is in the context also of the church that corrupted discipline is exercised. If those who are entrusted with the work to entrust the biblical teachings to faithful men ever go astray, he is answerable to the church for his conduct. And those being trained are answerable to the church for their way of life. So here, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, we have the key text for ministerial training. It bristles with information. Whatever involvement the Lord will give us as a church in the training of men for the ministry, let us seek to conscientiously and faithfully Implement the apostolic directive for the training of men. We must not, in human wisdom, devise our own and think we're better than God. And let us pray that God will raise men to be trained for the ministry, the cream of the crop. Let us seek also to do our part in the training of men, whatever part God will give us in providence for it. And let us all support and encourage the work in the training of men for the future of the churches largely depends in this trustworthy endeavor. And your pastors are growing old. We need younger men. That should be a burden in your soul. As well as the burden of your pastor's souls. For the future of the church depends largely in this worthy endeavor. That God promised to help the church to do the training of men for the ministry. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Everything we need to know, not only as individual Christians, as families, but even as churches. We thank you that everything we need to know is in scriptures. Bless your word to our hearts. Help us to conscientiously implement the things that we have learned from this passage concerning ministerial training. Lord, help us to be zealous in our endeavors to do whatever in providence you give us to do in the training of men. And help all the members to support, pray for this work. And Lord, above all, we pray that you would raise many laborers to work in your field of harvest. And give us the best, the men you by grace have prepared, men after your own heart. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen.